Did you know that Virginia is the birthplace of American whiskey? Well, they've been making it there since 1607, and Catoctin Creek has been honoring that tradition of small craft rye whiskey since 2009. Virginia grain, Virginia water, and Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. This is brought to you by Smooth Ambler, a proud member of the Bourbon Pursuit family. Smooth Ambler builds on the traditional roots of American whiskey through innovative blends, proudly sourced whiskeys, and a unique line of their own homemade bourbon and rye recipes made in West Virginia. So venture off the traditional trail and go see them in Maxwellton, West Virginia. They'd love to welcome you to the family that they're building around their whiskey. Wilderness Trail is Sweet Mash Kentucky Straight Bourbon and Rye Whiskey, made by master distiller Shane Baker and fermentation expert Dr. Pat Heist. Whether it is high rye or weeded, cask strength or bottled and bond, Wilderness Trail is always non-chill filtered premium whiskey with unparalleled flavor. Distilled, aged, and bottled in Danville, Kentucky. It was a hell of a project, that's for sure. I was about to say, yeah. there's, there's <laughs> no shortage of money that you had to spend to make sure that all that stuff kind of starts being operational again. Yeah, my hair wasn't white when I started. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everyone, it's episode 322 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's episode, talking to Jacob Call of Green River, here's your weekly bourbon news update. The James B. Beam Distilling Company has unveiled the Fred B. No Distillery. It will produce several brands, including Booker's, Baker's, and Freddie's acclaimed Little Book Whiskey series of blends. It's powered by renewable energy through a high-efficiency electric boiler and through the purchase of renewable energy certificates. It will also offer experiential learning through distillation seminars hosted by Freddie No, and there'll be hands-on activities through the blending lab. There will also be a tasting bar to sample new and yet-to-be-released innovations, but only for select members of the trade. Now, moving on to bourbon release news. Blackened American Whiskey started off as a collaboration between the late great master distiller Dave Pickerel and Metallica, but is now under the guidance of the brand's master distiller and blender, Rob Dietrich. He's unveiling a new Masters of Whiskey series, and the inaugural release is blackened with Willet Kentucky Straight Rye Whiskey finished in Madeira casks. And of course, this is in partnership with Drew Colsey over at Willet. The series will combine strengths from renowned whiskey makers to reimagine craft whiskey and create more complex expressions. This started off with a base of low rye and high rye whiskey recipes that were handpicked from the Willett Family Estate Reserve selection, and they're aged on average for around six and a half years. Then after the rye whiskeys were married together, they were then finished in Madeira casks for up to 14 weeks. During the finishing, the whiskey undergoes the proprietary black noise sonic enhancement process in which the finishing barrels are then pummeled with low hertz frequencies from Metallica's music. These will be available in limited quantities, bottled at cast strength, which is 109.6 proof, and it retails for $140. Middle West Spirits has announced the launch of its new double cask collection of whiskeys, featuring a sherry cask finished bourbon, an Oloroso wheat whiskey, and a ported pumpernickel rye whiskey. The sherry cask finished bourbon is aged a minimum of six years, first on heavy toasted American white oak barrels that were handcrafted in Ohio, and then it matured in a sun-blackened Spanish Solera sherry cask. The Oloroso wheat whiskey was aged for five years on lightly toasted barrels before being cask finished in Spanish Oloroso sherry barrels. And the dark pumpernickel rye whiskey spent at least five years in a medium toasted barrel before it was moved to a French tawny port cask. These will be available starting October 1st at retail stores in 32 states across the country, all are bottled around 100 proof and have retail prices ranging from $100 to $125. Blue Run Spirits is releasing its Kentucky Straight Golden Rye Whiskey. This small batch whiskey comes from 91 select barrels and bottled at 95 proof. And each bottle is adorned with an oxidized version of the Blue Run's signature Viceroy Butterfly and can be individually identified through a green neck strip with gold accents indicating the bottle number and the date that it was bottled. This is now available at select retailers in the U.S. and will be sold online at bluerunspirits.com for $100. Rabbit Hole is releasing a new addition to its founder's collection called Race King. It's a five-grain bourbon using a unique mash bill of 70% corn, 
13% rye, 10% malted rye, 4% chocolate malted wheat, and 3% chocolate malted barley. This bottling is offered at Cash Drink, which is 109.2 proof, and is presented in a linen pattern box featuring the brand's rabbit mark and a chocolate brown etching surrounded by metallic mocha appointments and racing silk blue accents. There will be 1,365 bottles available and it retails for $295. Back on episode 128, we had Jacob call on to talk about OZ Tyler. But back then, it was all about Terrapure and making overnight bourbon. But now Jacob comes back on the show to talk about overcoming that perception that OZ Tyler left behind, since it's now been rebranded back to the original name of the site, Green River Distillery. Jacob and the team at Green River, they've been doing traditional barrel aging since the very beginning. And we feel that they're producing some of the best bourbon at a young age to the point where we're starting to see contract brands like Bradshaw Bourbon beginning to emerge. With that, enjoy today's episode, and now here's Fred Minnick with the Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Jason Murphy, who writes me on fredminnick.com. Listening to the Bourbon Pursuit podcast today about Dusty Bourbon. Oh, that was a good episode, wasn't it? has me pondering what is a bourbon that just sits on the shelf these days that you see that could possibly turn into a Dusty in the coming years that we should start hunting. Woo, boy, that's a loaded question there. Um, I think Smoke Wagon is a bottle that obviously has a lot of acclaim. Uh, everyone's hunting it, but Smoke Wagon has one of those appeals that you know, in, in 20 years, it may be the highest uh, auction item in American whiskey if, if its fanship continues. I think a product like Fourgate 2 has some legs, uh, you know, so, if, you know, that's not kind of like on the obscure line that's, you know, going to be a little bit more difficult to obtain, but their stock continues to rise. So Smoke Wagon and Fourgate are, are bottles that aren't just necessarily sitting on the shelf but I, I definitely think that you should stock up on those if you're looking at it becoming a Dusty down the road. And I would be buying by the case if you're looking at kind of capitalizing on like a future Dusty market or whatever. I would be buying by the case a uh, Wild Turkey 101. You know, they'll probably, in 20 years, they'll probably change their packaging 30 times by then. Uh, so Wild Turkey 101, this is, this is a great everyday pour and you cannot beat it for the value, just incredible value, Wild Turkey 101. I think at some point, Wild Turkey is going to resonate with a mainstream bourbon consumer. At some point, you will not be able to find Wild Turkey 101 anymore. And another one would be Elijah Craig. So Elijah Craig, I think, is a, is a product that's, you know, they're putting a lot of effort into Elijah Craig at Heaven Hill. So that's an everyday product that you can find on the shelf right now that I would uh, I would consider to be a quality dusty in the coming years. Also, it's bigger brother in the barrel proof series that, you know, those are a little harder to get these days, but that is one that in the coming years that will be like a highly sought after dusty. Uh what's another one? Hmm. I'm gonna go with uh I'm gonna go with a rye. And some of those Indiana ryes, you know, that are really, really, really good. But, and it's gonna, this is gonna surprise, probably gonna surprise a lot of people. This is something that we, a lot of us pass by on a regular basis. But Bullet Rye, Bullet Rye is made at MGP, like a lot of other ryes on the market. And it is a, you know, for for the money, it's a banger. You know, it's a really good deal forward uh, rye, and it captures a, kind of that Indiana rye profile pretty well. So I think as uh, as that distillery gets more acclaim and more people get to know it for its rye, I think Bullet Rye in twenty years could be could be a dusty. So, but uh, really great question there, Jason. And hey, if you want to be like Jason, uh, hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. And maybe I'll read your Above the Chart question next time. Until next week, cheers. Barrel Craft Spirits is all about transparency. Check out their back label and you will see every state of distillation that goes into the batch. Find out more at BarrelBourbon.com.
Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan here today with a repeat guest on here. Something that yes. you had the opportunity to actually go to Owensboro one time and, and interview him. And I think it might have been one of the, the shorter podcasts that we'd ever released too. I think it was only like a, like 20 or 30 minutes, but. Yeah, I was, think it was like my first time without you. Like I was panic mode. <laughs> uh, I had my list of questions and I like, I was like, I got to get through these. And I was like, shit, it's only like 20 or 30 minutes, <laughs> but it worked out. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. But it kind of gave us a, a little precursor for for what we're going to talk about today. And yeah, it's, you know, I think this is. Honestly, it's one of the things that I'm really, really excited about because they have some of the the best whiskey that's coming on the market and super excited to see a lot of the brands that are being built by them. And I mean, it's just really good stuff too. Yeah. When I was there, I, I can't remember, three or four years ago, it was, it was all kind of a mystery what was going on here. You know, there was rapid aging, there was different things going on. I think they were still trying to kind of figure out what they were doing with their their brand and their contract distillation and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I'm super excited to revisit because uh, when I was there, I was telling Jacob before, I was like, man, I tasted some of your new make and it was pretty good. And I wish I had the foresight or the capital to, <laughs> to buy, buy some more to barrels. buy a bunch of it. But uh, yeah, it's a fantastic product. We've had the pleasure and we're going to taste through some today as well. But uh, yeah, it'll blow your socks off for, you know, some of these are only two to three maybe four, but they're really good at those young ages. Yeah, I know. Especially the four. I can't wait to get to it. Cause I remember I got a media bottle sam- or a media like sample that was sent to me. I think it was at like three and a half years or something like that. And I remember trying it and making you come over. And I was like, dude, you've got to try this thing. And then I ended up just crushing He's it. He's blushing now. You, you may not be able to see it. <laughs> you guys are making me blush. I yeah. appreciate all the comments. He's like, thanks for this words. love fest. <laughs> uh, we're going to we're gonna bring you up, then we're going to take you down, then we're going to bring you back up again. Yeah, That's how okay. it is. <laughs> all right. So you've heard his voice. This is Jacob Call. He's the master distiller and general manager at Green River Distilling, who is also our former guest back on episode 128. So Jacob, welcome back to the show. Good to be here, guys. So before we kind of get into this and start talking about the whiskey and all this other kind of stuff too, I want to bring back, uh, start digging into your childhood, start digging into oh your, boy. yeah, I know. <laughs> We're going back. This is what yeah. Gail Kenny shows up. That's why ours was only 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Short and sweet. Well, you know, laying on the couch, we're going to start dissecting everything that went wrong and how we got to this point. You know, I, I was reading a little bit of your, your bio, you know, your third generation distiller and, and. They had said, you know, you had memories of, you know, going through the Rick houses as a kid. Kind of talk about growing up a little bit uh, in a family business here of, of kind of having quote unquote whiskey in your veins. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a little bit of new news to actually share. My family, you know, I've been from Kentucky, goes back a long, long way. So I, I didn't really realize it until I hired a genealogist uh, several months ago. And I'm actually an eighth generation distiller from Bourbon County, Kentucky. Oh, wow. So, okay. uh, yeah, a guy named Samuel Call, who was my eighth, we dug up, we found his uh, his will, and um, he had a couple stills. He had a 75-gallon still, 120-gallon still, uh, 1791, uh, back before Kentucky was even a state. Wow. So, you know, I've got some, uh, I got some long lineage in the bourbon industry. Any, like some... any recipes in there? In that will? <laughs> I've not found the recipes yet. But, but you love them. I found my great, 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 great grandpappy's yeah. recipes. I was like, I thought that was coming next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, back to, to more recent times, my, uh, my grandfather did work at Jim Beam. My father worked at Jim Beam. And then my father, um, he left in the nineties and we went to, uh, Florida, a company called Florida Distillers, and he created the Cruise and Rum products there, master distiller there. Um, since that time, he, he's retired and he does Pilar Rum now. But um, yeah, they're it, in Key West. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from Bardstown, Bardstown guy, moved when I was 12. And just to get to come back, you know, to Kentucky and, and get to rebuild a historic distillery is kind of a once in a lifetime thing to get to do you know and as a kid you know when your dad and your grandpa are talking about bourbon and and whiskey you know your eyes always your ears perk up and if the opportunity uh was to ever come back up i was gonna jump on it so glad i did yeah so give some listeners some context about restoring a historical distillery what you know what uh what you all took over what you you know what was the history with the project you're doing now yeah, I mean, you know, the the facility dates back to 1885, originally known as the Green River Distillery, and 
it it burnt down 1918 right before prohibition was rebuilt right after uh prohibition 1938 all of our brick buildings are from 1938 the medley family had it for for a long time but it was shut down in 92 and it was in rough shape when i got there a lot of roof damage water damage i mean we spent millions and millions of dollars to rebuild this place and uh you know we've tried to pay pay homage to the history there uh, eric gregory with the kda calls it hallowed ground so we were very careful about how we restored some of the brick buildings but the bones were good we had some mash cookers well we had our doubler was still good some fermenters were good so we you know all new piping all new electrical all new plumbing and if you go on a tour there you'll see some of the old photos of the work that we've done but uh you know it's 26 acres and it was a hell of a project that's for sure i was about to say yeah. there's there's no <laughs> shortage of money that you had to spend to make sure that all that stuff kind of starts being operational again yeah my hair wasn't white when i started i don't, <laughs> I don't think when you were down there yeah <laughs> mine's doing the same it's uh it's it must be this industry it, it must be the industry it just really takes a toll so, on you a little bit there. the thing that i was amazed about was when i came and visited you is like how big the property is and how many warehouses and how how many were did you inherit warehouses space and whatnot yeah so we have six uh, we have 26 acres we have six warehouses on site and then we're we're building additional warehouses off-site uh, now we have 10 off-site warehouses and we're building a new warehouse every 90 days to keep up with production wow so we're we're cranking out Fuse some barrels win again <laughs> <laughs> yeah no shortage of where Our barrels goes. go so but in, in so in 2014 is when you came to uh, this location. It was called OZ Tyler. Kind of talk about the transition of the name from OZ Tyler to mm -hmm. Green River. Yeah, so uh, OZ Tyler, he was the, the founder of the company um, and he had passed away uh, before we were finished with the project. So our former CEO decided it'd be good to name, you know, name it after him. You know, but we, we really always had our eyes on the Green River name and the Green River trademark guy named uh, Rob McCulloch, uh, who's the great, great grandson of J.W. McCulloch, uh, who started Green River, owned that trademark. And uh, it took uh, several years of negotiations <laughs> to, get, uh, to get our price right uh, on, a, on acquiring back that, that trademark and name. And, you know, there's a lot of brands that have been, been brought back uh, over the years. You know, Peerless is an example of an, an old brand, but I can't really think of a of a brand that's been brought back to its original home. Uh, you know, the distillery's been rebuilt, and then to bring a brand back to that spot and rename it is pretty unique. I think. Yeah, I'm I'm just curious. So, if somebody owns the trademark to Green River, what would they do with it? I, I mean, if they're if just kind of like just waiting for the right buyer at the right price. I mean, it's I guess it's like, it's like domain a domain. Yeah. yeah, domain squatting or something like that. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I think he realized this was his best shot. So yeah, <laughs> we wore him down. His only shot. <laughs> his only <laughs> shot. I'd been like twenty dollars. Take it or leave it because yeah. this is best as you're going to get. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Rob's a great guy though. He's got he's got a ton of memorabilia. Uh, we've opened up our visitor center again. We've got a whole Green River museum that'll have all the old memorabilia uh, that he's collected over the years. We've got J.W. McCullough's desk uh, from you know 1885 uh, on site. So. Wow. And Done you get the job, DSP like, 10 on there now too, right? Yeah. Did, or so. did, did you already have that or does that come with a new name? We had that, you know, the, the Medley family actually did a fantastic job keeping that old DSP number throughout the years, even though they were shut down. So we were, we were able to inherit that with the site. That's cool. So what was, I guess well, I was going to ask the question, like, so what was harder to get the DSP or the name of Green River? Green River name, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because we've had Corky on the show before to talk yeah. about trying to get back to DSP because, you know, you have DSP KY 2,940, what, actually, it's probably 21,000, 20, yeah. you know, crazy. And it's like, how do you, how do you kind of get that back? But it sounds like the Medley family was generous enough to make sure that you all are kind of able to get back to your roots on that one. Yeah, yeah, that, you know, that, that family themselves, they've been distilling. For a long time, they're uh, uh, pillars of the community in Owensboro, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of the history of Green River, uh, let's talk about it a little bit too, because I, I did some, some reading here and it was known as the most expensive spirit sold. 
at one point. Yeah, they, uh, it was the, he- the most heavily advertised brand pre-prohibition. Uh, they were the official uh, whiskey of the Marine Corps Hospital, uh, won a bunch of awards in Paris in the 1900s. But the, an interesting story is that McCulloch traded uh, 20 barrels for a gold mine, interest in a gold mine that <laughs> actually panned out. So it officially became the most expensive whiskey ever sold. Oh, <laughs> man. That was what to say. It was like whiskey barters for a lot of different things now. I mean, I, when the, the, the crypto thing was going crazy, people were trading bourbon for, for Bitcoin and stuff like that. And I've seen people that have traded bourbon for Corvettes. Oh, I've traded bourbon for contracting work for all the <laughs> types of things like golf entries, you know, like whatever Panthers tickets I've done. I'm going to NFL game in here in a few weeks. And, uh, I was like, I'll give you some good barrels for some tickets. And like, heck yeah. <laughs> yeah my dad <laughs> always, leopard, uh, yeah. my dad always said you could get more done with a bottle of bourbon than a $20 bill or. Oh yeah. So I think I he's right it. on that. That's a, all right. If, <laughs> if your dad has any other sage like advice that comes through here, <laughs> feel free to drop it. Cause I'm sure people will like to hear those things. So, you know, the other part, I mean, just getting a gold mine out of it. I mean, when you say it panned out, I get the pun, right. You know, panning for gold. <laughs> uh, was there any anything else to the story of saying like, oh, it actually ended up being, you know, very lucrative, uh, the gold mine or anything like that? Any other kind of anecdotes of that story? There's some old pictures we found. I mean, that's a that's a pretty old story. We don't have a lot of data on it, but we I will tell you that we're opening up a uh, a cocktail uh, little lounge in our uh, visitor center. It's going to be called the uh, Twenty Barrel Saloon. Oh, <laughs> you know, cool. There we go. Always a play on something, right? Never, never miss an opportunity for marketing. That's, that's for sure. right. That's right. <laughs> Talk about the packaging. Is it a play on? And uh, forgive me for not knowing, but is it a play on the original packaging from back in the Park Prairie Prohibition? Or yeah, it it has some uh, some of those design elements. Uh, you know, the dots and the glass. But uh, what's really unique about it, we have a we'll ha- we have a horseshoe in the bottom of the glass. It'll be a very uh, it's a very unique bottle. Uh, that will really stand out on the shelf. Custom bottle that we did. Uh, there's some Owensboro, Kentucky design elements in the glass. Got to give a lot of credit to Simon Birch, our CEO. He definitely has a, a marketing background. He was uh, head of uh, marketing for Smirnoff for Diageo. So he's taken us to a whole new level uh, with our marketing. He worked really hard with uh, Chuck Lyle with our uh, marketing team to develop the packaging. And I think it's something that's really going to stand out and look really sharp. We were talking before this. So you graduated from Murray State with a marketing degree, correct? I did. So when you see the teams coming together to figure out what the labels can be like, the bottles can be like, do you like to have a hand in that? Or do you say like, "Ah, I'm going to set this one out? Well, my name's on the on the package. So yeah, (laughs) anytime my name's on it, I get involved for sure. I mean, so kind of talk about some of your your process or when you're when you're looking at it and how involved you are with the process. Well, you know, uh, with this one, it was definitely a collaborative effort, but we wanted to pay, uh, you know, pay respect to the history of the brand. So, you know, we didn't want it to come out and look like some big new modern flashy bottle. It, it's definitely uh, has a historic historic look to it. And when your name's in the bottle, do you get like a an anxious feeling? Is it nervousness or do you, you feel pretty confident about what's, what's going to be happening? Uh, I'm super confident. Yeah. yeah this one's going to be a rock star. Well, that's, <laughs> that's good to know. I was like, when we, when we put our name on anything, it's like, we put a stamp of approval on it. Yes. But it's also like living in our You don't own realize bubble. how insecure you are until you put your name on a bottle of whiskey <laughs> and start sending it out to people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wish I had your same confidence. <laughs> <laughs> So talk about, so, all right, Green River. So is that going to be like your flagship, you know, everyday kind of offering? Is that? Yeah. So we have a couple things that are going to, that's going to happen. So the green, the initial product is bottled and bond. So Green River bottled and bond uh, will lead the way uh, for the brand. Uh, Then we'll come back with a standard 90 proof option on the bourbon side. And then uh, later in in 2023, uh, late 2023, we'll, we'll come with a rye. Green River Rye. Cool. So there's th- other brands coming out of the distillery too, right? From different from the Green River. That's, is it the under, that's under your, or is this all Green River? It's just you. Well, that brand, Yellow Banks, Yellow Banks is a brand that the distillery owns. It's one of our brands. And that is a partnership collaboration with the Kentucky Corn Growers Association. 
we put their uh, logo on our label and we give uh, 5% of the sales of the product uh, go back to Ag Research in Kentucky. Really proud of that, that brand. Uh, we buy all local corn direct. It says it was established in 1797. The Yellow Banks, uh, the, that was the original name of Owensboro, uh, Yellow Banks. So, uh, yeah. uh, I don't know what, what is I that like where that morning. gold mine was? Is that why it was Yellow Banks? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing I kind of want to talk about is when OZ Tyler came about and especially in the bourbon world, it made, it made some noise, but it wasn't the most, um, what we could say positive noise coming out of it because people were saying, oh, it's hyper age is this terror pure process and kind of talk about what you all have done to either, you know, phase it out of your whiskey portfolio or, or anything like that. Yeah. You know, the, it, the terror pure process, it's a separate division of our company now, uh, based down in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, we use it for, uh, for vodka products, some tequila products, even on some, some barrel finishing stuff with some staves because it uses staves in that process. But, uh, you know, for us, the future at Green River is all about uh, history and, and aging. And, you know, we're, we've got some four-year-old stuff now coming online uh, that we're super proud of. We're just excited to share that uh, with everyone. Yeah, because everybody was under this assumption that everything that was going to be coming out of there was all going to be just terra pure. And lo and behold, four years later, it's like, <laughs> nope, nope, we, we have, we're doing traditional aging the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that was a, a misconception for sure. Go ahead and clear the air. <laughs> <laughs> air yeah. your grievances here. Yeah. So, you know, we, uh, you know, we do stuff with other brands and other partners, you know, Terry Bradshaw is a good partner of ours. We do his production, not terra pure. Uh, we've got some other brands uh, that are not terra pure. It's an option for some of the other customers you know, that we bottled for down in Charleston. Charleston, if they want to do that, fine. Uh, but for Green River and for us, traditional. I'm a, uh, I'm a traditional uh, bourbon guy through and through, as we talked about. So I would say with eight, all with, with eight <laughs> generations, you know, it sounds like it was pretty money well spent on, on hiring your genealogist as well. Yeah. You know, just just five hundred bucks I ever spent. <laughs> oh, really? That's all it was. I was about to say. I was like, you get charged just for that, like signing up for um, Genie.com or uh, what was it, the Tree, whatever that is online. So, yep, Family Tree, Family or... Tree. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Let's go ahead and let's let's taste some of this. So, right, sure. let's we'll start off with uh, with some of the the, the Yellow Bank here. And that would be on your left, and it'd be on my left. Thank you so much. Because <laughs> I was going to start with the rye. <laughs> yeah. So, kind of walk us through a little bit about Yellow Bank and and. I mean, you kind of talked a little bit about the, you know, the history, the collaboration and stuff like that. Talk about the whiskey too, because sure. uh, I think most people want to know, you know, what's in the bottle, how many barrels you're producing, kind of still, kind of co- what kind of right. coopers you use and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. So this is a uh, 70, uh, 70 corn, 21 rye, nine malt, uh, about two and a half year old product. We do a number four char on all of our barrels. This one's got a bit of a butterscotchy. Yeah, uh, get that rough about. Yeah, I definitely do. I mean, and like this is amazing. A little, it, like a little banana note or two. Or and I guess the this is the the real question is, you know, Jacob, we get a lot of bottles sent to us from a lot of different places. Hardly any of them taste this good at two and a half years old. <laughs> so you got to tell me, you know, whether you, whether you're dumping butterscotch packets in no. there or like <laughs> what's what's going on and how are you all doing this? I mean, is you're still just like have a, a, a Midas touch to it? Like what's going on? Um, Man, that's really good. <laughs> it is a combination of a lot of things that, that have to go right. Okay. So, you know, we buy corn direct from Kentucky farmers. We inspect, you know, all the trucks, we meet with them. Uh, we know who they are. We mill our grains to a very fine, fine consistency with a finer screen, maybe a little bit finer than some people do to get more starch out of it. Just the recipe itself uh, with the higher rye content, I think helps a lot. Mm-hmm. And then our still uh, plays a big part in it. When I built uh, the column still, 54 inch column still, but- I Oh, put, it's a big one. Yeah, I put a, uh, a copper, big four foot copper section in the top of it. Uh, we have copper condensers, we have a copper doubler. We have a couple different proprietary yeast that we use, strains. Nothing that, you know, Samuel Call passed down to you. No, you no. Scraped, that will. You scraped off an old I, pipe I somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, traditional aging, number four char, but just a lot of things 
that come together, I think, uh, to go right. We come off our still a little bit less. We come off it on the beer still at 120 and then 138 on the doubler. We barrel at 120. You know, that's not traditional. 125 is pretty standard. So we just do a lot of maybe a lot of little things that come together the right way. Yeah. I mean, so is that mash bill? Is that, is that Green River's mash bill as well? Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53 gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. Savor every drop of summer at Total Wine & More because they've got a sizzling lineup of pours for the great outdoors. Get ready for the holiday weekend with their top 12 wines under $15 and beat the heat with refreshing bourbon cocktails. So why not serve a brown derby made with bourbon, grapefruit, and honey at your next barbecue? Then taste your way to a new flavorite. With over 500 bourbons, Total Wine & More is the place for whiskey lovers. Looking for something new? Well, check out McFarland's Reserve Kentucky Straight Bourbon. Extra wheat in the mash bill makes it especially smooth. You're sure to find cool prices on over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers in store or at TotalWine.com. The Heaven Hill Bourbon Experience underwent an expansion, renovation, and renaming as a culmination of a multi-year, $19 million investment in Kentucky's signature industry and a model for the future of tourism. The state-of-the-art visitor center is an interactive, educational space offering signature exhibits unique to the visitor center, including a You Do Bourbon Experience, where guests are guided through a tasting of unique products. And to commemorate your visit, you'll have the opportunity to bottle your favorite bourbon or whiskey through the custom designed filling machines. And then you can apply the label and personalize it in the bottling room. To learn more about bourbon, Heaven Hill's history, and their award-winning portfolio, go to heavenhilldistillery.com slash booking to schedule a tour. Heaven Hill reminds you to think wisely, drink wisely. Cheers. So is that mash bill, is that, is that Green River's mash bill as well? Is that kind of your base? Magical? Yeah, that's our standard. We have some others. We have a, a 78139, which is more of, I call that like a, a heritage mash bill. That's similar to a Jim Beam. Uh, when my dad came with me, when we fired everything up, uh, that was what we ran first. We did <laughs> yeah. that for a little bit. And then I said, no, nah, it works. Know. <laughs> we know it works. <laughs> that's hilarious. So I guess I talked about that because I'm sure like when your dad was there, he's like, yes, hey, this is gonna be the money, son. This is what you're going to want. And then how did you say like, hey. We're just going to go ahead and change well, it. We had to go back you. to Florida. So I was like, <laughs> you're like, stick to rum. <laughs> <laughs> now I wanted something different. You know, I wanted, I, I, I like that uh, spiciness that comes through from the rye. And I, I just thought it was a, like a really good combination uh, when we could have the sweetness from the corn, but that spice, it just helps it along, I think. Yeah, it's got a great, but I'm amazed by how creamy and like, uh, velvety it is like on the tech for two and a half year most time you get it it's like very astringent you know bold the green just, apples a yeah, bit of hay, yeah you know but it's like no on burn. the front mid palate's like so decadent and rich um with that butterscotch vanilla you know kind of caramelized sugar thing going on i mean very wow. much like an 86 old granddad it is i, I was about to say that so he <laughs> took the words out of my mouth and that's only only available in kentucky uh it's in our gift shop and then some limited markets in, in kentucky so and now in kenny's basement so there you go make sure you stop with the it. rest of your collection <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i guess you know part of this of, of figuring out what the mash bill was going to be did you have some sort of insight to say like this is this is what i think it's gonna be or like we've got to test this we got to make it sure we'll we'll test it at the end of the distillation run and i think i'll have a good good idea kind of talk us through your your thought process there yeah you know ryan talked a little bit about our new make and, and tasting stuff off the still and it's got to start you got to start out with good new make you know over half of it comes from the barrel but you know a big part of it comes from the flavor profile that you get off your still so you know we i could kind of tell that wasn't overly sweet, sweet enough, had enough spice to it. 
we tinkered around a little bit uh, with the the proof that we came off of and settled on that. Yeah. I mean, so just a lot of iterations and kind of figuring out what the new make is and then uh, I guess sit and pray. Went, went wild yeah. Ages. I mean, you know, um, we did a lot of sampling out in the warehouse and uh, after about year two, I was like, all right, we're all right. We're going to be good. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. guess talk about some of those times like sampling in the warehouse of like when you when you had that that uh, that aha moment that said we're going to be okay here. Yeah, you know, we're a small company, our distillery. We we've, we've grown rapidly. I I was number employee 1, but we've got about 80 employees there. We got wow. great staff and you know, I try to you know, I get everybody involved. We'll go sit out on the back porch and we'll pull, you know, a few different uh barrels and I have my, some of my folks there and you know, what do you think? What do you guys think about this one or that one? And it's it's team effort for sure. And so when you're pulling these barrel samples, are you trying to find, are you you're doing some experimentation, trying different char levels, trying different mash bills? You said like, you know, we've we've got our, our one or two staple items. We're just going to start cranking these things out because we feel that they're they're pretty all right. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we want the, once we nail it down, we want the same, right? We want the same every day. We want to try to make the same consistent product. We do, um, we do a lot of experimentation though. You know, I've got some three char barrels. I've got barrels from different suppliers. I've got uh, some pretty cool barrel finishing projects going on right now that will release those uh, probably every quarter uh, moving into next year of, you know, just different types of barrels that maybe some people haven't thought of yet. I was like, <laughs> if you say Mizanara, everybody's beating you to it. Everybody's on that train too. So <laughs> no, not that one. That's not, not that one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we know, we know that at least. And so this one is, is cut to 90 proof, right? Or 92. 92. I can't read. Yeah. So w- when you're, when you're going through and you're, you're tasting, you're sampling, how do you decide this is going to be good at this proof? Yeah. You know, I like, uh, the Green River Bottled and Bond will be a hundred proof, obviously, uh, I like a hundred proof. So. I, mean, I, I like a hundred proof a lot. I mean, that's kind of my sweet spot. Sweet spot, a hundred, hundred and five. I think it just brings out the flavors a lot more. Not a big fan myself of of eighty proof stuff. I just think it loses too much punch. But you know, there's that balance between taxes. You know, the FEP, <laughs> the higher proof. You know, we're we're still a business, so ninety ninety two. I think and ninety is a good compromise yeah i mean taxes it's, and taste it's well taxes taste and i guess approachability for a lot of new bourbon drinkers right. and people on the trail that they're just they're there to have fun they're not they're not the the kenny and ryan's and other bourbon nerds of the, out there that are like trying to pick you apart can, <laughs> can i get the 125 proof yeah. version like yes yeah we do some barrel uh barrel samplings right out of the barrel and you know some some of our visitors are like whoa <laughs> back to the 90 proof <laughs> <laughs> From what you've pulled out of samples so far, what's what's the highest proof that you've uh, found so far? Uh, so far, I've seen a, a 124, but that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I ain't seen anything higher. Are you now. anticipating some to go higher depending on where they're located? Probably, you know, we have one time. warehouse. We have Warehouse G, which is a, a metal-sided warehouse. I anticipate we'll have some higher stuff on those upper floors. Most of our warehouses are brick, brick-sided. But, you know, we do get a lot of, lot of temperature change, a lot more than I was expecting in those brick warehouses. And so when you're trying to figure out, and I did not really figure out, you're, you're putting barrels away in, in brick warehouses and metal, metal clad warehouses. And I mean, we know that, uh, you know, between, you know, MGP and Bernheim, you know, they all have a lot of these brick warehouses too, and they don't allow as much, uh, crazy kind of temperature and fluctuation swings. So have you figured out a certain barrel taste or character or profile is going to come out of this warehouse versus another one and how you either allocate that to a brand or to a buyer or anything like that? You know, our, our upper floors of our brick ones, they still get really hot. We get a lot of heat. We've got uh, rubber roofs, uh, black rubber roofs on top of our warehouses. You know, it, it definitely it definitely ages differently. You know, our first floor stuff, smoother, a little bit lower proof, probably be some older product will come off our first floors. But, uh, you know, some of that's still to be determined, I think, as we get into some age, you know, we've got to still have a very limited amount of four-year-old, you know, we had to, uh, we had to, uh, we make, now we make uh, 90,000 barrels a year. So we wow. had to, uh, had to pay some bills by uh, selling off some of our bourbon in the beginning. Sure. And you got to get that money churning in. That's, uh, it's totally understandable. So how big a brand will Yellow Banks be? How many bottles per year, cases per year? 
we're still trying to figure that out. I think, <laughs> uh, Ryan, it's, it's uh, as much as two year and a half, two and a half year old whiskey they can find in those warehouses. Yeah, it's it's still super limited uh, right now, just in Kentucky. But you know, they could you know it could get up there to fifty thousand cases one day. Yeah, I mean, it, you are. I mean, it's, it, everybody kind of knows there's a lot of contract distillation that that goes mm-hmm. on over there at Green River. Um, you know, with ninety thousand barrels a year. They got to go somewhere, right? So it's it's definitely, uh, but I mean, it, it's very exciting to see some of the products that are that are coming out of here. But you know, when I taste this versus when I taste like Bradshaw, they do taste different. Yeah. Um, so kind of talk about like why am I tasting the differences uh, in these two different kind of whiskeys when they're coming from the same place and potentially the same mash bill and same barrels and everything like that. Yeah, you know, it could be you know different yeast strain involved with those two, uh, but but also every barrel ages differently right? Every, there's no two barrels. Some of them are really close, but you know, you all have done a bunch of barrel picks and you've seen seen the differences in barrels. So everything that we're doing now is I would consider it small batch. I mean, you know, we're not dumping 20,000 gallons of of bourbon in a tank, like some of these big guys where we can have real consistent standard profile. We try to get as close as we can but they'll be a little bit different. Everything's small batch for us right now. So Yellow Banks uh, two years from now might be a little bit different, but it'll be close. With a partnership like Bradshaw, are you help guiding them like with picking barrels or picking a flavor profile or do they have someone on their own team? Have you talked to Terry Bradshaw? We haven't yet. (laughs) yet. We're we're about to. (laughs) He is a character. Uh, He's a great guy. He's heavily involved really big on you know the Bradshaw name and the brand and image and he wanted something that he could be proud of I do work with his uh, associate Ryan McElveen Ryan's actually a sommelier and uh, very good palate and we taste things together Ryan and I do and then he'll send it to Terry to make sure he's he's good with it but yeah when we did when we did uh the original uh, Bradshaw stuff it was numerous samples it was I don't know a dozen that he picked through to figure out what he liked. Well, I want to figure out what's going on with this next one here because we've got the, <laughs> we, this is the the Green River. I think this is the barrel selection that you had kind of sent us this right one here. Was like three and a half or three? No, this one is four. Four. So okay, this is a uh, uh, bottled and bond. Oh, and, man. Uh, that butterscotch really comes off. Yeah, it really kind of shines through on this one. That's for sure. I mean, yeah, the nose is more vibrant at that hundred proof. I was about to say, so was there a, is there a little piece of you that, that, that died inside, you know, as you said that you had to sell some of those barrels off at the very beginning to, to kind of get some money in the door and start that rolling is because you, oh, you, you look at it, you look at a paycheck. it. Yeah. I mean, right. It is, <laughs> it is nice to, you know, to live, you know, it's, it's nice <laughs> to have food. Um, but you know, that's also the thing that says, you know, I built this, it's, it's kind of like rebuilding like a Chevy or a Corvette or, you know, something like that. And then realizing that I've um, I've got to pay a bill or something else, I got to sell that. And now you're like, oh, I wish I had that car back. Yeah, I mean, we were fortunate enough to save as little as we could, but yeah, yeah, you're right. A little bit of a little bit dies inside of you when you see those barrels go out on that truck. <laughs> yeah, but at least you know that it's going to go into something. I mean, yeah, somebody it, just part of you want to age a lot of this a lot more, or you like this is. And it's it's funny because there is a there's a, a huge stigma in the bourbon community of like, yes, like we need six to twelve year old bourbon. Like nothing's good until that point. This, this is, is really good at four. Yeah, I was like it's this ready is ready as a, is. This is a this is a, a, a very much a uh, that was this would prove the naysayers wrong per uh, per se. What's your kind of mentality or thought going into this and saying, like, no, like we're pretty good at like three or four here. I don't know how much we need to really go in higher up in age. We're going to go. I mean, we're going to go. We're laying down some six-year-old stuff. You kind of- thousand barrels. You, you kind of have to. Yeah. Uh, you kind of have to. Um, for me, you know, six, seven-year-old wow. has always been my kind of, you know, six, seven-year-old stuff I like a lot. Uh, but I like this a lot too. This is, I, I call this uh, Christmas in a bottle. I mean, it's got cinnamon and spice and cherry. and Yeah, it's got, to me, I'd, like the front's kind of like that Dutch apple pie crust, like rich caramel, little crumbles. And then it just moves in some of the, there's, I think you mentioned cherry, but there's some like bright fruits that just come out right towards the mid back palate or they're just. It's phenomenal. Really good. I've never had passion fruit, but I'm feeling passionate about this one. So <laughs> uh, maybe that's what I'm tasting. I like that. I like that. <laughs> maybe that's why people say passion fruit when they. When they were, yeah, they, they don't really know what they're doing. I actually have had a passion fruit before. Uh, 
mostly when you travel to like a Caribbean and you go, oh, passion fruit punch. I think that might be the closest. I actually had a passion fruit now that I think about it. Gosh, this is really good. It really is. Well so, done. What do you- That's you, why you're confident. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was about to say, I was like, I, I don't know too many places you'd be able to go and taste four-year-old and be like, this is, this is knockout. This is amazing. But I know we're keep bringing you up here, but tell me, what do you expect to happen to this when you hit your six, seven, eight-year mark? Like what, what is your, what is your hypothesis going into this? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm really kind of a humble guy. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see what the people like, you know, it's, it all comes down to repull and what people like and what they want to buy and what their flavor profile is. I mean, there's so many different bourbons. I mean, we make weeded bourbon and we've got all kinds of different recipes. We do over 25 different recipes at our distillery. So have you found this one to be the one that somehow is a cut better than the rest or like how, yeah, are, how are the other ones? That's our, uh, that's our go-to. We call it OSB, our standard bourbon, <laughs> ah, 70, 21, like nine. But, uh, you know, we do the high corn varieties. Uh, we do weeded bourbon. We do rye whiskey, which we'll get to in just a second. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about not only this product, but, but where it's going for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, it can only get better, right? A couple more years. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's pretty so, damn good as it is. It's so tough. I mean, even, even, you know, us as independent bottlers and we've got some barrels too. And we're like, gosh, do, do you risk it? And and keep aging it and see what happens. Well, they got, say, 90, they got ninety thousand. They got ninety thousand. We have like 10. nine. <laughs> ninety thousand and nine, right? It's a little, yeah. little bit different of a very variable there. But yeah, I mean, there is there is the the idea of like, gosh, how much longer do you want to wait? And it, how much could better can it get? You know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it, you know, it, I think over time it'll pick up some more of just that wood characteristic, maybe a little more of that chewiness that bourbon gets. But uh, that'll be later on, I think. Yeah. Well. Let's go ahead and dive into this rye over here because this yeah, is the first, first time, time we've ever had first time trying the rye up here. So I guess the uh, the question I'll ask you when we start with the rye is it's very sticky, right? And oh yeah, rye's rye's tricky to work with. You know, foams gums up bad. Uh, we got some tricks that we use with our rye. It makes you uh, wonder why people even mess with rye with how much trouble it is because we have had a lot of master distillers on here and everybody hates dealing with rye because of how like just painstakingly obvious it is to just clean it and keep it going. Yeah, I think we figured it out. You know, you got to remember back in, uh, back when we got started, we were kind of competing against MGP for a little bit, you know, so we were making some, some bourbon kind of competing against those guys. But we also said, Hey, we can make some pretty damn good rye too. So we made a 95, five rye and, uh, we're sold out of our rye. Don't have any more to sell on the, on the bulk market. Got a waiting list for our rye. And um, why would you tell us that now? Be right before be, we drink it and we fall in love with it. We just be, had to have uh, that foresight four years ago. Yeah. Um, this will be, uh, this will probably be released uh, end of next year, maybe, yeah. as a Green River product. Mm -hmm. So this is 100 proof. So what's the, uh, what's the thought process of going with a, a traditional 95.5 and not saying we'll do a 51? Like a Kentucky ride that, which I, yeah, it's like a 51, 56. Well, there's a couple reasons I think that, that that's always been the case. As you mentioned, rye is hard to work with. It's also more expensive. So traditionally speaking, you know, a lot of the big boys were making 51% rye uh, for those two reasons. We wanted to make something unique and different. And uh, if we're going to make rye, it's going to be a full on, full bodied in your face rye to compete with somebody like an MGP. So, yeah. There's well, a full bodiness, but they're still like, with all three of these, I get just so much like creaminess to them. There's creaminess, like, yeah, fruitiness. Yeah. And there's... Something that you usually don't get at this age is, like I said earlier, it's astringent. These have like that creamy texture and flavors going on that I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I mean, you get that typical spearmint, you know, that you're used to with the MGP, but the creaminess is just it adds to it. I don't know. It's a, little, it's a cut above. It's another, <laughs> another cut above there. <laughs> yeah, it's sweet, sweet yet spicy. Yeah, I, exactly. I it's got a combination. This is their OSRB, our standard rye bill. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'll, I'll kind of ask a fun question for you here. Uh, what do you kind of see happening in the bourbon world that you think that there's, we should change or that there's room for improvement or maybe just kind of like irritates you or something like that? And I haven't thought about that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> on the spot. You know, I, I don't like it when, when people just you know, buy bottles and let them sit on the shelf and never open them. Oh God, like, you, like here? I mean, you've been here. Like, <laughs> like this guy. I mean, most of them are open though. So I'll give you that. At least they're yeah. open. 
Uh, but, you know, I, I think bourbon should be made to be shared and enjoyed with, with friends and not a big fan of it just sitting there. Uh, it needs to be tasted and tried. Let's start opening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Cost him a what's, few thousand dollars. Yeah. What's the running joke you got over here? Yeah. Every time I come here, I cost him a thousand dollars. I open up a bottle. <laughs> I, I would believe that. Yeah. yeah. But the problem is, is there's, there's nowhere else to put any bottles. That's, we've, we've seen it. There's, it's literally spread across the floor. So. I've got to figure out ways to, I need to have more friends over. That's what it comes down to. need to have a yeah. big party, big it, block party. Yeah. I can't drink all this. <laughs> yeah. We need more people. <laughs> Once at some point we will make that happen. So, you know, another thing I, I kind of want to kind of talk to you about this too is, you know, drinking bottles and everything like that too is, you know, one of the things that we found that uh, we end up amassing a lot of bottles is through like private barrel picks and stuff like that. Have you all thought about uh, a private barrel selection program happening at Green River with, you know, some of the age product that you are putting out? Yes. Uh, we've been kind of waiting for the, for the Green River brand and the label to be, out, be able to have an avenue to do that under. Yes, we get inquiries all the time about doing private barrel picks and um, that'll be coming out after the launch of the Green River brand. So probably next year uh, we'll lean heavy into that. All right. Well, sign us up. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 take, can, I can see two. this as a pursuit series. We'll take two. <laughs> you know, we'll, we can do it. No, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic whiskey. And, you know, it's, it's, it's great to learn more about, about your history and thank God you got out of banking to do this. I know it's been a, it's yeah, the I don't best see you decision as a banker. I've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been an identity conflict. Like, what am I doing here? It was, banking? It, it was rough there for, for a few years, but glad I, you know, crossed over to the good side. My, my days are definitely funner. Oh yeah. Well, sure. what, I guess that was probably should ask at the very top of the podcast was what was that moment that you said, I'm not doing this shit anymore. Like I've, <laughs> I've got to go back and start distilling and, and figuring out like, well, how do I follow my, you know, my, my family lineage here? You know, that would have been about 06. That was kind of when the, uh, the housing market was in really bad shape and crashing. And cause you were a loan officer. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, I was actually COO, uh, for Republic oh, bank, that, that uh, too. down in, uh, down in Florida and we, they bought a bank down there and, you know, it wasn't the best time to be in banking not uh, in Florida, Florida. Not uh, yeah, Florida. That time. So, you know what? I, I called my, my dad and I said, Hey, I think I want to get back into uh, the liquor, liquor business with you. And he said, okay, good. I think he was excited, you know, that I decided to do that. But he, you know, he always uh, wanted me to have another job first to do something else. You know, you never want to just get handed anything in life. So uh, it was good to be able to go do that and then, then come back. But you know, as a kid, I had, you know, I worked with him at the distillery in the summers. I had all the, the uh, less glamorous jobs. I worked on the bottling line. I worked in processing, you know, cleaning tanks and building batches. We had a big cattle ranch down in Florida. I took care of all our cows. We had several hundred head of cattle. So, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's fun to get to just go from basically on the bottling line to to doing all this now so working with your mind to working with your hands you know? that's right yeah there's something gratifying about that and kind of talk about the your, your you know your dad and the impression the the knowledge he instilled like what was that process like as well i mean you haven't met him he's he's super super talented we both we both wear kind of the the same hat he was operations but also you know master distiller so you know we we heavily involved in the operation side of things but, uh, you know, he always described us as the blue collar, uh, you know, guys, some of the other people would get a little bit more of the, the glory, but somebody has got to do the damn work. So, uh, we were kind of the worker guys too. So, so when you have Christmas time and you bring some of your products and he tries them, is he proud of you? He's like, nah, you, you still got some work to do. <laughs> no, he, he likes yellow banks. Yeah. Uh, he really likes yellow banks. And, uh, you know, on the rye, he was a super rye skeptic. He was like, I don't like rye. You know, it's just, it amazing. I think a lot of old generations never wanted to touch rye. Yeah. yeah. But, and, and he actually paid me a, maybe a backhanded compliment. He said, I don't like rye, but I like your rye. <laughs> <laughs> Rye's good. Does he ever say, you should have went with that 18%? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Now that I know he works for Pillar Rum, I go to Key West every year. I'm going to stop in bother him next time yeah he's in lakeland they have a bottling plant in lakeland he pops down to key west gotcha and, and, but he helped set up their distillery for him that's so. real cool that's real cool so i mean it it sounds like it's a it was a, a great bonding moment as well for for you and your dad to kind of come together and, and you to you know really absorb some of the knowledge and you know what he was able to to kind of share with you and stuff like oh that yeah too. i mean he was super super impactful and helpful you know when we got started rebuilding the the green river distillery we had old notes from 
you know, the 70s and, and 80s. Uh, he was, uh, Booker No was a family friend of ours. My grandfather was friends with Booker and worked with Booker. Uh, but my dad was Booker's kind of protege. Uh, my dad learned under Booker. He was his right-hand man at Beam uh, in the 70s and 80s. But uh, yeah, I mean, we had, I've got like the original old granddad recipe. You know, I've got copies of all that stuff. My dad's a pack rat. He kept everything. So, idea. Him and Kenny get along. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I still remember sitting down at his kitchen table when we were, you know, doing the, the I was doing the calculations and the recipes of, you know, of our, of our cooks and um, how many bushels of corn we're going to put in each cook and fermenter and all that to get started. And you know what? We never, uh, never threw a batch away. So it, everything's worked out perfectly ever since. Gosh. <laughs> Talk about hitting a home run or a grand slam on your first time at bat or something like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But Jacob, I want to say thank you again for coming on the show once again uh, and, you know, sharing more about your family history sharing some of your whiskey with us. I think everybody's yeah. going to be super excited to- It wasn't 10 a.m. I would sit here and drink all day. These. They're, they're really good. <laughs> but I mean, I think everybody's going to be really excited about the launch of Green River. And and I'm serious. Go get your hands on a bottle. Uh, find some that's that's coming out. Uh, Yellow Banks is great. Uh, bottle and Bond is probably going to be fantastic. So again, cheers and congratulations yeah. on this launch too. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks for all the kind words. Yeah, it's definitely the best hidden secret in the bourbon. I was like, to... unfortunately, we didn't get to bring him down a little bit. We were oh, like, no. ah, this one's not too good. I mean, they were all solid. He brought all the good ones. <laughs> I know. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> when you're the master distiller, you'd go cherry pick all the barrels that you want to hit. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure these are, they're all going to be very good representations. But uh, people want to know more about Green River, uh, you know, stopping to say hi. Uh, where would they be able to do that? Yeah, so we have our website greenriverdistilling.com. We do tours. We're a heritage member of the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. We do tours six days a week. Uh, I'm there most of the time. So uh, feel free to stop in and say hi and sign a lot of bottles these days. So come see us. There you go. Make sure you follow them uh, and you know get your hands on a bottle because like I said, I think we've been very yeah, blown away. Blown away. Blown away is an understatement. But also make sure you follow us, Bourbon Pursuit, wherever you get your podcast as well as on all the socials. With that, cheers everybody and we'll see you all next week. <laughs>